Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Church Cross this morning. If you're joining us online this morning, welcome to you as well. Um, glad we can be worshiping together this morning. If you don't know me, I am Pete, one of the pastors here. And if you don't know me, if you're a visitor here this morning, I hope you feel extra welcome and are really able to join us in this whole service. Do make sure you have one of our bulletins. Um, these are in the back. You want to grab these. It has the whole service uh, along in it. And if you're joining us online, you can download that from our website. I also want to point out our simple little welcome cards. Uh, this is just an easy way for us to know that you are here. It's also an easy way if you want to request information, you can fill this out put it in the offering plate as it goes by. You can even put prayer requests on there. So notice those will be in front of you or alongside the pews somewhere. You can grab these. Just throw them in the offering plate when you're done with them. Uh, then I'll mention after the service, we have hot coffee and some little fruit snacks in the back. Those are for everyone. Kids obviously love the fruit snacks. Not as much the hot coffee, um, but the adults love that probably. Enjoy. Stay around. Chat. We love an opportunity to get to know you a bit more. At this point, please stand. We'll begin our service on page four with your opening hymn. I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. All desires known and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. At this point, too, we're going to be dismissing our kids to their classes, uh, but first we'd love for them to come on up so we can pray for them before they head. So preschoolers through third grade, come on forward. We'd love that chance to get to pray for you. You're first. Good job. Come on. It's okay. I'll let you guys in on a secret. There's a chance for you to come back up at the end of the service. You'll see what happens. Ooh, mystery. All right. If you'd like to pray with me, uh, with them, if you'd like to join our prayers, you can just stretch out your hands towards the kids right now, and we'll all just be praying together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for these kids. Thank you for um, the way you love them. Call them by name and draw them to yourself. Continue, we ask, to do so. May they hear your voice. May you be with your teachers and leaders and give them um, help and wisdom now. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, everyone, head back this way for class. We'll continue now with our readings. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from the book of Ezra. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, And he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. And let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Then rose up the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. And all who were with them aided them with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, with beasts, and with costly wares besides all that was freely offered. Cyrus, the king, also brought out the vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and placed in the house of his gods. Cyrus, king of Persia, brought these out in the charge of Mithridath, the treasurer, who counted them out to Shishbazar, the prince of Judah. And this was the number of them, 30 basins of gold, 1,000 basins of silver, 29 censers, 30 bowls of gold, 410 bowls of silver, and 1,000 other vessels. All the vessels of gold and of silver were 5,400. All these did Sheshbazar bring up when the exiles were brought up from Babylonia to Jerusalem. Now these were the people of the province who came up out of, capti- out of the captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried captive to Babylonia. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town. The word of the Lord. A reading from the book of 1 Corinthians. For the, word of God, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? 
Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip, and he said to him, Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida in the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, and he said of him, Behold an Israelite, indeed, in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus answered him, Because I saw you, and and I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. The Gospel of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we join with Nathaniel this morning and proclaim together that you are the Son of God. You are our King. We pray, Lord, that you would give us uh, submitted hearts and um, curious uh, minds uh, to, to learn from you, to grow in you. We welcome your presence and are thankful for your work. We pray all this in your holy name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, thank you all for being at the early service today. It's a special person that comes to the early service in sub-zero weather, so we're so thankful uh, to be gathered together in this warm place and to uh, worship uh, together. Um, I'm guessing I'm not the only one who's had um, this experience of um, uh, having a, a time of life where things are going well where there's lots of encouragement, where there are blessings, right, where there are clear answers to prayer, and alongside feelings of gratitude and feelings of joy, there's a sort of a slight, maybe and sometimes even a, a less than slight, feeling alongside that of dread or of anxiety. 
this feeling of things are going so well right now, and there's so much to be thankful for, I'm just waiting for things to turn, right? When are they gonna go bad, right? When is it gonna get hard again? And I know that's sort of the classic definition of pessimism, but I think even for optimists, which most of the time I am, we have those moments, right? Where we feel like, how can I celebrate this good thing when I know there's gonna be difficulties, right? There always are to come. I had sort of a strange experience uh, um, when Church of the Cross was still a very young church. I kind of had this season where I was wrestling with this this desire um, that uh, I really wanted to retire. Um, Again, I was under 40. Pastors don't usually retire um, young. (laughs) Um, uh, And uh, things were going well. Again, I, I actually loved my work and my ministry. But I think that feeling came from things were going well at the church. We were seeing answers to prayer in in amazing ways. And I kind of felt like, man, if I could just get out now uh, before things start to get difficult, before we run into conflict and challenges, which always happens, right, in the church and in life, I thought that would be so nice, right? I just kept thinking, you know, I don't play the lottery, but how can I figure out retirement? I'm glad I did not retire, uh, to be um, clear. But again, it was this sense of, Right. How can I fully enter into this cel- celebration? Maybe a bit like, if you remember in the, the Gospels, we have the moment where Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration, where he is transfigured before um, Peter and John and James, right? And they see his glory, and they actually see Moses and Elijah standing beside him, appearing before them. And Peter says, this is great. Let's build some shelters. Let's stay here. I'll build them for Elijah, for Moses, for Jesus, and we can just stay on the mountaintop. Right? And of course, he's thinking, right? I want to stay in this place of glory. Right? Jesus keeps talking about how he's going to suffer and he's going to die. Maybe we can just stay up here on the mountain and we can avoid that. Right? We can miss out on that. We're beginning uh, today a series on Ezra and Nehemiah, um, two books that go very much uh, together. And we'll be in this series um, through uh, Lent. And as we can see, right, as we heard in our our first reading today from Ezra 1, right, it begins, right, with this great moment of celebration, which is an incredible uh, answer to prayer, a fulfillment of God's promise, right? God's people who have been in exile have been away from Jerusalem, right? The temple has been uh, destroyed, are told, you can go back, right? Cyrus, the king of Persia, sends them back and tells them, not only am I sending you back, I'm sending you back to rebuild your temple, and I'm providing financial means for you to do it. Again, an incredible moment of celebration. But we can read this, and we can know things are going to get hard, right? If you're familiar at all with Ezra and Nehemiah or just the history of the nation of Israel, you know there are going to be challenges, right? This is awesome that they get to go back and return to the promised land, but we know, and we'll see as we continue to read the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, significant challenges are going to come. A major theme of these books that will come up again and again for us is how do you remain faithful to the Lord, to his calling, right, in the midst of challenges, in the midst of resistance, in the midst of enemies who are seeking to pull you away from obedience to the Lord. We also know, again, that those challenges will remain even to the time of Jesus and his ministry. One thing that's kind of heartbreaking when we read the book of Ezra is we see Ezra, who actually doesn't show up for about 100 years. Um, So this begins, and then Ezra will, will show up later in the book of Ezra. But Ezra, who's a scribe, who's a teacher of the law, and who teaches the law in order to build up the people, in order to strengthen them, When we get to the place of the Gospels, primarily the times we see teachers of the law appear, they're resisting Jesus. They actually have been given this responsibility to teach the law, and yet often, not always, but often we see in the Gospel, they use it to actually keep the people down, to not allow the people to grow and to to prosper, right? And so there's even a, a heartbreak in that, right? We see a scribe and we think, oh, but aren't the scribes the bad guys? Well, unfortunately, in the Gospels, they often are. But I want to suggest, right, that this beginning, right, is not a a source of dread for us. We should not read this and feel anxiety, but rather we should feel hope. Because the message, right, we see very clearly here is God makes a way for his people to fulfill his promises. He does it here. He does it throughout the scriptures, right? He does it in moments of great joy and celebration. And he's doing that in moments of trial and difficulty. Right? God is always making a way for his people to fulfill his promises. Right? So you got my three parts there of the sermon, if you're wondering. God makes a way for his people to fulfill his promises. All right? So we actually want to start um, at the ending and begin with God fulfills his promises, right? which we see uh, right there um, in the first verse. 
in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be filled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, right? So he made a proclamation throughout his kingdom and also put it in writing. Then we have that proclamation, right? The, the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be filled. So right at the beginning, right, we're being told this is the fulfillment of something that the Lord said would happen. Right? <laughs> Jeremiah prophesied it, actually Isaiah prophesied it, and we had some of the places that Isaiah prophesied that we saw that in the season of Advent. There are a number of places in Jeremiah that we can look to where we see um, this uh, fulfillment of this promise. One of those comes from chapter 29, perhaps the best known um, section from Jeremiah, certainly perhaps the most quoted uh, verse uh, from Jeremiah. Um, it says this, uh, these are a few verses from the second part of chapter 29 in Jeremiah. And 70 years are completed for Babylon, right? Most people mark that 70 years from the time of the destruction of the temple to the time of their return. I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me. And when you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Right, the parts of Jeremiah sometimes that are kind of confusing and not clear, that's so clear, isn't it? After 70 years, I will bring you back home. I will set you free from exile. And so a very clear promise is being fulfilled. Right? But as we note this promise, we should also note, and I think it's important to know as we consider all the promises of God, that God had also, through Jeremiah and through other prophets, warned the people that if they continued in disobedience, they would go into exile. Right? So as we celebrate, God fulfills his promise to bring them back out of exile. We should also remember he had also promised that if they continued in idolatry, they would go into exile in the first place. So another place, right, in Jeremiah, he says this, right? Thus says the Lord, because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send for all the tribes of the north and for Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then after 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation for their iniquity declares the Lord making the land an everlasting waste. So you hear in that a couple things right, that are important. I want to take note of one, the Lord calls Nebuchadnezzar his servant. Right? And we'll talk more about that in just a minute, but we have Cyrus, the servant of the Lord. We have Nebuchadnezzar, the servant of the Lord. Right? God works right through these kings. And so he says, Nebuchadnezzar is my servant. Right? I'm going to use him basically to discipline you, my people. But he also promises Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, he also calls them the Chaldeans, they will answer, right, for their sin. They too will be judged, right? I'm the judge of all. And so again, we hear in this promise, right, something, you know, sobering, right, a warning, right? And we too receive those promises. As we receive again and, and know that God fulfills his promises, right? Sometimes the response to that promise, right, is, is repentance. Sometimes the response to God's promises is remembering, right? I need to continue to turn to him and to seek his help to continue to cry out to him, right? And again, oftentimes the response to those promises is the hope and holding on. God will fulfill his promises, right? Through um, his ways, right? And through various means, right? But his promises are always redemptive, right? Even the promises of warning, right? Even the promises of discipline, ultimately the goal is God wants to restore us he wants to redeem us, and he is bringing us home, as he does here, right, for his people. As we consider, again, the promises of God, just note um, there's a contrast, and we're going to be talking about a few different contrasts um, this morning, right, but there's a contrast there. We have the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah being fulfilled, but we also see the word of Cyrus being fulfilled, right? And we're specifically told that Cyrus made a proclamation, and he put it in writing, um, that's important, right? We'll find out later, right? It's really good Cyrus put it in writing, right? Because it's actually going to be referred to later um, in the book of Ezra, right? We'll come back to this. And this is actually just one of 20 places in the book of Ezra where the written word of a proclamation, right? A written word by a king or by a leader is referenced. 
And so the written word becomes a major theme in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. We see, again, the written word of different kings and different leaders. And there's a contrast then with God's written word. And obviously, right, God's written word is important throughout the scriptures. But it's interesting, the prophets, there's much more of an emphasis on the spoken word, right? The, God, the prophets speak the word out. They proclaim the word. They call people to repent. Repentance. Of course, it's written down so we can read it today. But in Ezra and Nehemiah, we see that emphasis on the written word. Again, Ezra's call is a teacher of the law, right? He sits down and he unpacks the word for people. And we, of course, move on to the importance of the written word. Central to our faith is the written word. And we see right away, right? Cyrus's word is powerful. He says it and it happens, right? It begins with he proclaims this. And where do we, what do we get to as we get to the end of this passage? They return to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town, right? Cyrus said it was going to happen and it happened, right? So his word is powerful. Yet again, there's a contrast to God's word, which is much, much more powerful, right? Cyrus is passed on, right? Cyrus is, is gone now, right? We can still read his words, but God's word remains living and active, right? God remains as king. So as we see the power, right, that these different kings and authorities have, the way their written word changes things, right, we know it's God's written word which ultimately changes things. God will fulfill his promises. His word stands forever. So we have the importance of the word. God fulfills his promises, again, for his people, right? And one thing we can celebrate as we look at this passage is that there still are a people of God. Right, they have been brought into exile, right? Think about it, right? What, what defines in many ways the, the Jewish people, right? A couple key things are the land that they belong to and the temple and temple worship. Those are not the most important things. The most important thing is they're defined by the Lord, right? And his calling upon them. But they've been removed from the land. The temple has been destroyed. How easy it could have been for them to lose their sense of identity, Right? Who are we? Right? We're no longer in the land that God promised us. We can no longer go to the temple and make offerings to our Lord. We can't worship him in the way he's called us to worship him. Maybe we're not a people anymore. You can see how easily they could have lost their identity. Right? And there's a national identity that's important, and we see that right, in this passage. Right? I mean, they still have the prince of Judah. Right? They still have a treasure. Right? There's still roles that people play. But more important than their national identity, although, again, that was very important to them, was their missional identity, right? Their ministry identity. They were a people called from the very beginning with the calling of Abraham to represent God to the world, to be a nation of priests, to receive blessings from the Lord and to be a blessing. And we get lots of indication that they have held on to this. At least many of them have. And we are called actually to bless, even in exile, right? And so we see actually the Lord protecting that identity actually through calling them to bless the very nation that has put them into exile. Again, lots of um, Jeremiah quotes today. This is actually, once again, from Jeremiah 29. Earlier in Jeremiah 29, God had given this direction to the people as they were settling in Babylon, in again, a nation where they could say, we don't belong, right? This is not our nation. He says to them, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your son and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. So again, in this place of exile, the Lord has said, don't forget your identity is that you are called to bless those around you. You are called to represent me. Seek the welfare of the city. Now, this is somewhat speculative, right? But when we see actually the people around them, their neighbors, giving them silver and gold and goods and beasts and all these things, right? Partly that's because Cyrus told them to, right? And if the king tells you to do something, you do it. But we got to wonder, right, if some of it is they had sought the welfare of the city. They had sought to bless their neighbors, right? They had embraced the communities that they were part of, even as they kept their unique identity. And in doing so, when the time came for them to return, right, their neighbors said, we want to help you. We want to bless you. You have blessed us. We will bless you. So as we think about what is our unique identity, again, there's a way in which our identity as people of Christ, as followers of Jesus, right, that we are sojourners, right? We're strangers, right? In the sense that sort of the rules of the culture are different, right? We follow the rules of the kingdom, the calling of the kingdom. And yet we too, like them, we're call, are called to seek the welfare of the cities where we are, to seek the welfare of the people. 
as we do so, actually our unique identity, right? Our, our identity as the people of God is protected, right? Sometimes we, we think about our identity as people of God kind of puts us in this, again, place of adversary, right? Where we're thinking about what we're against, and there are things we're against. But first and foremost, we're defined by what we're for. Right? We're defined actually by seeking to be a blessing to those around us, to loving even our enemies, right? And as we do so, actually, as we seek the welfare of the city of our communities, as it says in Jeremiah, in its welfare, you will find your welfare. So as we celebrate, right, the people are still there, right? There still are people. God has protected them, again, through giving them a mission. And that mission hasn't stopped. And God is now bringing them back, right, to the land to continue that mission, although many will stay spread out, right? Many will stay in Babylon, right, or in Persia. Now it's no longer Babylon, now it's Persia. Gassar has taken over, right? We'll see, you see in the book of Daniel, right, Daniel doing powerful um, witness uh, to the Lord as he stays um, there um, in Persia and ministers, right, um, uh, through the Spirit, right, into his calling there. Now I didn't include, I just included the first verse of um, chapter 2, I didn't include the rest of chapter two, one, because the readers would be mad at me if I had. It's a lot of names, right? And it's already a good long reading. But I really encourage you um, this week, again, as we con continue on in this um, series, maybe take a minute and read through chapter two. It's one of many places in Ezra and Nehemiah where we have a lot of names. And if you think about like um, in situations where um, there's been a tragedy, right? And, and people's lives have been lost. Oftentimes, in remembering that tragedy, there'll be a service, right, where the names of those whose lives have been lost will be read, and then there's a time of silence, right? And what are you doing during that time of silence? You're saying, those people matter, right? Those names, right, hearing those names, I remember, yes, that's an individual who matters to God. Their loss is meaningful, right? And this list of names in chapter 2, while it's not about a tragedy, the message is the same. These names matter. Right, these names are so important to the Lord that he includes them in his word. He wants you to know these are the people, right? These are the families, right? Some of it is understanding their heritage and their connection. But some of it is you just want to know these are real people who were brought back. Right? Who took the journey back to Jerusalem, who helped to begin to rebuild the temple. And so it's good to, you know, read the names. Again, if you're doing a Bible plan, a Bible reading plan, it's always that temptation. Can I skip over the names? Maybe you can kind of skip over. But I encourage you, take a moment to say, ah, these are real people. But God knows their names, and that means God knows my name, right? And my unique calling, just as he knows their unique calling. So again, God makes a way for his people. He protects his people. He cares about his people. He wants to see more people become his people through his people. So then, going back to the first part, as we keep moving backward, God makes a way, right? And specifically, God makes a way, we see, through Cyrus. Again, God had predicted, right? The Babylonians would lose power, which they did. The Persians would come in, they gain power, and specifically, he works through King Cyrus, right? And this is actually not the only mention of Cyrus in Scripture. It's actually mentioned in Isaiah, and in Isaiah, Cyrus is called an anointed one which is, right, Messiah, right, Christ. Now, Cyrus is not the Christ. He is not the Messiah, of course, but he is in many ways sort of a foreshadowing of Jesus, right, which is kind of amazing, right? I mean, he's a pagan king, and yet we see Cyrus setting the prisoners free. Now, again, his setting the prisoners free is small compared to Jesus setting the prisoners free. Jesus sets us free from sin and death, right, and brings us into his kingdom, and yet again, there's a foreshadowing, right? There's a pointing forward to Jesus, the ultimate Messiah, the, the true Messiah, in Cyrus. And God works through Cyrus, a pagan king. In Isaiah, um, the Lord says this about Cyrus. He says, I name you, though you do not know me. I equip you, though you do not know me. But Cyrus, right, seems to have some knowledge of God, right? It doesn't seem that he has put his faith in the Lord. Again, Isaiah makes that pretty clear, right? He has not become a follower of Yahweh. He has not submitted himself to Yahweh, but clearly has some sort of connection or belief. But he actually refers to God as the Lord, the God of heaven. Right? At that time, right, you, it was pretty common to say, hey, there are different gods in different regions. There are different gods for different people groups, right? Sort of this God has power in this area, but Cyrus seems to be recognizing, right, that the Lord, the God of Judah, is actually the God of heaven. 
Now, we should note here that it may be what Cyrus is doing is he's saying, I know the Jewish people believe that their God is the God of heaven, so I'm going to give them that, right? Because from what we know from Cyrus, from other historical documents and, and records, is he basically had the mentality of, if you let people worship their own gods, if you encourage them actually in their worship, if you let them rebuild their temples, even help them rebuild their temples, they'll like you um, as a leader, right? They'll, they'll be impressed by you and they'll be easier to govern, right? Some people say Cyrus was the um, inventor of propaganda. Whether that's good or bad, we can debate, right? But he basically <laughs> decided win people over. Right? And so there probably is an element, actually, that he's saying, I'm going to you know, use the language that the Jewish people use, yet clearly God is working through him. We have right, the proclamation that they can return to Jerusalem, but again, it's followed by, actually, financial provision. As he says, right, give to them. He commands the people, give to the Israelites so that they can return and rebuild um, their uh, temple, um, and he gives um, generously. Now, as we consider this, right, the neighbor's giving, right, this recalls another key moment in the scriptures, the exodus. If you remember, right, as the Israelites got ready to leave Egypt, um, to go out from slavery in Egypt, if you remember, the people, their neighbors around them, around the Israelites, the Egyptian neighbors, gave them gold and silver and great goods. Now, maybe because they were just so relieved, right, that the you know, Israelites could leave and they could be free of all the you know, um, uh, suffering that they had experienced because of the plagues, right? But again, there's a recalling of that. Clearly, as we read this, if we know that story, we're going to think about that story. And actually, in the Exodus as well, later, after the Exodus, after they have been um, set free from Egypt, there's a moment where they begin to build the tabernacle, if you remember that. And Moses says, give of your goods, of your gold, of your resources to help build the tabernacle. And the Israelites give so much for the tabernacle that the builders of the tabernacle actually go to Moses and say, tell the people to stop giving, right? We've got too much. A message you'll never hear from uh, the leadership at Church of the Cross. We can always find a way to spend money. <laughs> Kidding, um, joking about that. But anyway, that's the generosity. All right, so you have this abundance that you see here, and it recalls the abundance of the Exodus and the way you see God providing in amazing ways. Now, I bring that up, one, because that's going to be a theme we see, right? Connections right? <laughs> to them coming home, to their first uh, uh, journey to the Promised Land. But I also bring that up, right, because when you think about that contrast, that gives us, again, a contrast between Cyrus and Pharaoh, right? And Cyrus, while he seems actually eager to send the people home, right, and to bless them, Pharaoh, of course, was not. And Pharaoh, we see again and again in the book of Exodus, he hardens his heart, God hardens his heart. And there's a hardening, there is a resistance from Pharaoh. And yet, even with Pharaoh's resistance, the people are, go home, right? The people are set free. Right? Again, God used Nebuchadnezzar right, to bring the people into exile. He calls Nebuchadnezzar my servant. He calls Cyrus my servant. Pharaoh ultimately was his servant. And I share that to say as we celebrate right, you know, God working through Cyrus here, the emphasis is not on Cyrus. The emphasis is on the Lord. That the Lord can work through whoever he wants to work through. Cyrus seemed like a good king in many ways. But God can work through bad kings. But God's going to make a way no matter what no matter who the leader is. Right? So here we are at the beginning of 2024, right, as we're anticipating what's to come, right? what does this year hold? Maybe for some of you, right, there are things coming in this year that you know are gonna be difficult. Maybe there's certain things that you are feeling some anxiety and some worry about. Maybe that's culturally, nationally, internationally, maybe it's very personal. And maybe for others, right, you have things you're just anticipating. Right? There's just things you are, can't wait for in 2024. Maybe for some of us, it's like, well, I think it'll be similar to the past years. Maybe that's good. Maybe that's bad. Right? But no matter what, right, we can say God will fulfill his promises right, in this coming year. Right? God will continue to protect us as his people. He'll continue to value us as his people. He'll continue to call us to mission. And he'll make a way. Right? He'll make a way no matter who the leaders are, right? no matter who's elected. In our next election, he will make a way. I got to make a way no matter what trials we personally face, no matter what trials right, we face as a community, he will make a way. Nothing right, will prevent him, right? No king, no leader, nothing. I want to end uh, with a prayer, and I want to um, begin this prayer uh, with a quote, from, uh, again, from Daniel, a contemporary of Ezra and Nehemiah, um, who, again, will show up later as we continue um, in these books. 
a prayer that comes from the second chapter. So let's pray. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. Lord, we pray that you continue to shine your light upon us in the season of epiphany and in all seasons. Lord, continue to to lead us, Lord, and I pray that you would give us hope. I pray especially this morning for any who, in this season of life, are feeling anxiety, are knowing that perhaps there are challenges to come or perhaps they're in the midst of challenges, Lord, that you would give them hope, that they would know, Lord, as we will sing um, in just a few minutes, that you make a way, Lord, continue to, to lead us and guide us and hold on to us, Lord, as we hold on to you, as you have promised to do. And we ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Please stand. Turn with me to page 9 in your bulletin. Together we will confess our faith using the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who is spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for the prayers. Let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, hear our prayer. For the safety, well-being, and unity of the people of God, help your church, Father, to proclaim the peace and wholeness that only you can bring. Lord, in your mercy. For Foley, our archbishop, and Stuart, our bishop, and for the clergy and staff of all churches that faithfully serve you. Grant all local church leaders wisdom as they proclaim the gospel and serve their congregations. We ask a special blessing for Joel Bascom in our congregation as he prepares to be ordained to the diaconate next weekend. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For our fellow Anglican Church, Emmanuel Whitewater and Father Jens Notstad, their rector, as they build the household of God in Whitewater, Wisconsin. Bless their ministry to the residents of Mulberry Independent Living and Memory Care, as well as their ongoing relationship with Living Word Fellowship, whose building they share. Lord, in your mercy. For the ministry of Andrew Larson with One Collective and the organization Nezoi, within which he is serving. Strengthen them in their outreach to the homeless and poor and those affected by sex trafficking in Athens, Greece. We ask indeed today a blessing on all those fighting against the evil of sex trafficking. Lord, in your mercy. For our fellow Christians who face persecution for their faith in you, fill them with hope and faith and relieve their suffering. Lord, in your mercy. 
For peace, holy God, around the world, conflicts in Eastern Europe and the Middle East are complex, and enmity and bitterness abound in our deepening. Tensions are high in other regions of the world, and conflict threatens. We ask for you to guide the leaders of our country and other countries to bring peace to each of these conflicts that the people in Ukraine, Russia, Gaza, Israel, and all over the world could live without the fear of death, heartache, and constant anxieties that war brings. Lord, in your mercy. Tomorrow, our neighbors in Iowa begin the official process to determine who will be sworn in as our president. Guide those who follow you to remember that our salvation is only in you, and help us to know what it means this year to render under Caesar what is Caesar's. Bring to us a season of politicking that is remarkable for its seriousness and comedy. Lord, in your mercy. For all those who face sickness and other adversities of body, mind, or spirit, we ask for comfort and healing, specifically today for Carol, Catherine, Vlad, John, Michelle, and Roy. It is cold and dark here in northern lands, and the festivity of the holidays are memory. At this time of year in particular, bless those who struggle with mental health, bitter regrets, addiction, depression, loneliness, self-doubt, and self-hatred. Help each of us to be both encouragement to those who are at risk we know and to be strengthened in our own challenges. Heal those wounds of spirit which underlie so many of our struggles as you continue your, continue your work of sanctification in each of us. We ask for comfort for Peter and Jolyn Fredrickson and their family as Peter's mother, Janet, is nearing the end of her life. We pray for comfort in this final season and a closeness to God like she has never known as her home in heaven comes close. I invite you to pray now for those in your life you know that need healing. Lord, in your mercy. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, we give you thanks for the great cloud of witnesses and the perseverance they instill in us. We look forward with joy to our union with them and with you on that day when we enter your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The sacrifice of Christ has made a way for our forgiveness and our cleansing. Take a minute to listen to the conviction of the Holy Spirit before we confess our sins against God and our neighbors. We pray together, most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. and We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Take a few moments to exchange God's peace with one another.
Good morning. It's so good to be together um, on this cold, cold morning. Uh, I want to bring your attention to a few things in the bulletin. Um, first, on Tuesday, uh, the Women's Bible Narrative Study kicks off. Um, and there is child care available, but you need to let uh, Cheryl know. Um, email in the bulletin. Um, next, uh, Joel's ordination service is next Saturday, and we really would like people to RSVP if they will be attending. Um, and Father Christian has committed that there is going to be a sugar cream pie there, uh, which is a Hoosier specialty. And last, there is uh, the men's retreat, which is always a great time. Uh, second weekend of February, registration is open and details are in the bulletin. Just uh, one more um, to add. Uh, I made that joke about uh, giving uh, generously in the in the um, uh, sermon, um, but I should, in all seriousness, say we are very thankful uh, for very generous giving. Uh, it took place at the end of the year. We had shared some updates, and we were behind a budget. Um, and if you look at page 19, you can see we are actually slightly ahead of budget. So again. Thanks for giving so generously, and that's a great place to be. As we've shared before, we can make adjustments when we're not reaching budget numbers, and there's always things we can adjust as we seek to live within our means, but when we're on budget, it just gives us sort of the freedom to make sure we're fulfilling the goals that we had set for the year. So thank you so much um, for that, and again, um, uh, we praise God for his ongoing provision for us as a community. So um, now we'll, appropriately enough, continue with our offering. So.
Please stand. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and praise. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who took on our mortal flesh to reveal His glory, that He might bring us out of darkness and into His own glorious light. Therefore we praise you joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also, that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now as Christ our Savior taught us, we're bold to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Amen. You can be seated. This is the Lord's family meal. All who are following Jesus and have been baptized into him are welcome to come forward and receive this morning. Uh, the way, uh, if that doesn't respond, to, if that doesn't uh, apply to you, if that doesn't, isn't quite where you are right now, we'd still um, love it if you would be with us and continue to respond in prayer and worship. Or also, you can come forward if you cross your arms in front of your chest, uh, either myself or Deacon Cheryl. We'd love the opportunity to pray a prayer of blessing over you. Parents, give us guidance over your kids coming, if they will be receiving communion or if we'll be um, blessing them. Um, It'll work out that the uh, greeter will come and dismiss you by row. There's two stations. It's bread first, then you can take wine from the chalices, or it's the juice in the cups. Also during this time, I know we'll have prayer ministry available kind of at the halfway point of the sanctuary. If there's just anything at all that you would like others to be joining you in prayer for, uh, seek them out. They'd really love that opportunity to get to pray with you.
Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Uh, here at Cross, about once a month, we like to take time to acknowledge and pray for specifically people by certain vocations they have. And you see today, we have it down for vocational prayer for students. If a key part of your life is in learning and preparation right now, we want to be able to pray for you. We'd actually like if you'd come on forward so we can pray for you. So we're thinking, if you're an adult in school, going back to school, getting those online classes in, things like that. If you're a kid who spends, I mean, a decent chunk of your you know, week at school, which is a lot of you, you also get to be prayed for. So come on forward if being a student right now is a big piece of your life, we'd love that opportunity to pray for you. Don't make me call some of you by name. Josh, come on, Joshua. You're a student. Come on, man. You got to get up here, too. There we go. <laughs> Good job, kids. We got a couple of you. Come on up forward, and then you're going to turn and face that way. And then we're all just going to be able to pray for you together that way. So um, if you'd like to join us in praying for those who are students right now. There we go. We got some more coming. But if you'd like to join us in praying for students, please just stretch out your hands towards them. We'll be praying for all of them together as they come. <laughs> Good job. Heavenly Father, we remember before you this morning all of those who are students. We acknowledge that our Lord identified himself as our teacher and called on us to learn from him. Remind these students that growing in character and endurance is also part of their calling as a student. Grow them in discernment. We remember that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature. Help these students to follow his good example. We pray all this in the name of our Lord, in whom all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge reside, who with you and the Holy Spirit dwells in light now and forever. Amen. Thanks, everybody. All right. May Christ, the Son of God, perfect in you the image of his glory and gladden your hearts with the good news of his kingdom. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you now and remain with you always. Amen. God always makes a way for his people, doesn't he? And he says, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. Go forth into the world and proclaim that good news. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.